Hi, friends, and welcome to Let's Talk About Healthcare, a podcast about the challenges and the opportunities, the good and the not so good, and the moments of joy found all across our healthcare system today. And remember, it's up to all of us to make healthcare work better for everyone, one day at a time. Hello, friends, and thanks for listening. I'm super excited to introduce Erica Freckleton is our next guest. Erica is a, is a healthcare marketer and a seasoned digital marketer, but really is a search expert. She's really, really passionate about how search engines play a role in healthcare, be it from patient acquisition to referral marketing to hospital branding and everything in between. And is just such a delight to be able to get to know, to be able to hear and learn from uh, and to be able to work with. Erica is currently the digital marketing manager at Provider Trust, but has a background working in the agency world uh, as well as an in-house uh, search role, helping healthcare companies better their presence and discoverability online. Erica, welcome to the show. We're so excited to have you. Thanks, Dave. I'm psyched to be here. So today we're going to spend a lot of time talking about the role of search and search engines in healthcare, from all things patient facing to hospital marketing, and cover really some ground in between. But Erica, given her background and her expertise and the role that that the role that it, search engines play, I'm super excited for the rest of y'all to uh, everybody listening in to be able to learn from her. So, Erica, first question: Just give us a brief overview of your background. How did you get into healthcare marketing? How did you become an expert in search? Uh, just catch us up a little bit on, on sort of how you found your, your niche in this world. Yeah, absolutely. Um, healthcare definitely wasn't something I had on my radar, nor was digital marketing when I started my career. So I'm glad to have found myself here. I actually started my career in PR and I very quickly learned that it was not for me. But what PR did really offer me was the chance to work at an integrated marketing agency. And that gave me the opportunity to be introduced to SEO, and get the chance to start my career in digital marketing. Um, I've always thought search is just so fascinating because it gives you this unvarnished look into the mind of the consumer or in healthcare patients, for example. And I think what really drew me in, I just remember being floored the first time I got access to Search Console and got my hands on actual search data. And I was able to see the actual queries the exact phrases that somebody had typed in to trigger a search and see our website. And it just blew my mind. And there's so many ways to slice and dice this data. And I was really lucky to have a very thoughtful mentor early on who gave me access to a bunch of SEO tools, encouraged me to explore, asked me really thought provoking questions. And that just really stoked my curiosity for search as a whole. So why search in healthcare? What is it about healthcare and the role that search plays that really, uh, you know, has you so interested and and just continuing to to learn and to pursue that career? Yeah. So we know that billions of searches are performed every day. We know it plays such a role in how we see the world and shapes our worldview. When you think about it from a patient perspective, we learn about conditions from search we turn to search to honestly figure out when it's time to see a doctor. In the American healthcare system, we spend a lot of time trying to figure out, is this serious enough to elevate to the level of bringing in an actual professional? We use it to find providers, research diagnoses when we get them, learn about procedures, all of that stuff. And so I think it just plays such a big role in this really personal part of our lives. And I think that it's so important to have people in that space who really genuinely care about putting the patient at the center of that experience, just because there's so much riding on this. This is so important. It shapes everything about our lives. It's just really interesting to me and really, really important. So you touched on a couple of things there in in citing a few specific examples of how search plays a role in our healthcare system and the patient journey, the patient experience, right? It's such a it's become such an integral part of how we as patients access and learn about our own care, as well as how the the hospitals and post-acute facilities of the world actually attract 
patients and and drive their own business in in the current ecosystem of healthcare. Um, So just given that it is so prevalent and has become such an integral part of the experience on both sides, the patient, the provider, the insurer, right? Um, What what are the, you know, my, my thought immediately goes to what are the safeguards in place? How do we make sure, uh, you know, we live in this era of, of fake news and, uh, you know, illegitimate sources and inaccurate information? What safeguards are, are there in place on either side so that patients can be more informed or so that marketers can be more responsible? How does that play and how's the role of that changed sort of over even just the past year or so? Yeah, that's such a great question. It's something that's continually evolving. And this starts to overlap a little bit with media literacy when we start talking about what's the patient responsibility to vet these sources. When we're thinking about it from like a media literacy, what is the responsibility on the patient side? I think that there is a lot, a lot of work that can be done on teaching folks how to be responsible consumers of media. And I think that there are a lot of tools out there that can help us do this that we just genuinely don't know exist. Really great example of this, there's a phenomenal browser extension run by a team of seasoned journalists called NewsGuard, and it will tell you whether or not a news publication is reputable. They evaluate these sites on nine different criteria. They'll list like, do they disclose the ownership and who finances this? Do they correct errors and omissions? All of these kinds of things. And so I think getting more tools like that into the hands of consumers so that they can make more informed decisions about the information that they consume. I think that's a big part of it, but I would say it would be really irresponsible to shift that entire burden to the consumer. So looking at marketers, looking at tech companies, what is the responsibility that we all have to make sure that the information out there is safe and reputable? So when we think about Google and what they've done to adjust for this over the years, they have put some safeguards in place. We think about that standard 10 blue links on a Google search results page. And so if we think about like a medical search, you know, if you search for lung cancer, for example, we'll see them pulling in other reputable sources with really wide brand recognition and pulling them into special features on that results page, like the knowledge panel. So lung cancer, that example, they'll pull in Mayo Clinic and cite them. That's a brand that has wide appeal among patients. A lot of folks know who they are. And so they'll tell you where they pull their medical information from. And then on a broader level, I think algorithm updates like the one recently to ensure the integrity of their search pages where they prioritize things like EAT, um, expertise, authority, and trustworthiness. That was a really big thing in the search world just last year, honestly. And really this just comes back to who's writing your content. Are they trusted? Are they subject matter experts? Who runs your website? And so they're making all these changes on both a macro level and a really individual granular level to make sure that the information that rises to the top is reputable and helpful. So talk to me a little bit about the the impact that COVID-19 has had on the world of search. Certainly, this has changed healthcare in so many different ways and challenged healthcare in so many different ways. But as it, re- as it relates to um, the world of search, it's played a pivotal role, right? Especially mm-hmm. in the early days of this virus uh, being uh, just being in the top of the news cycle, um, right? The, the role of search became a pivotal one as everyday consumers and everyday patients are searching for symptoms or searching for uh, testing sites. Um, and and it's, it's just become a centerpiece of so much of what has been our collective shared experience uh, during 2020 and during the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic. So I'm curious to, to just hear from your, your words as an expert, what is the, what is the COVID-19 uh, impact to the search world? And maybe related is what's the role did search play? in, in, uh, as we all navigated this pandemic. Yeah, absolutely. Um, really throughout the pandemic, we've watched both Google and other tech companies for that matter, the Facebooks of the world and other similar players test out new ways of presenting information related to COVID-19 and this testing of features in real time that we've seen, this tells me a couple different things. One, it tells me that these companies know that they play an outsized role in shaping our worldview. And I think that 
these updates that they're making to these pages are a response to that. They recognize that it's no longer okay for their companies to sit back and abdicate this responsibility for monitoring what kind of information is being disseminated on their platforms and taking the stance of, we'll leave it to the consumer to decide what's reputable or not. So I think that is one of the biggest things I've seen is they're stepping in much more than they have in the past. And so some of the changes that we've seen for COVID, what that looks like specifically, they're testing all these things in real time. They're pulling in new special SERP features, um, search engines results page, that's what SERP stands for. They're pulling in all these new special SERP features and testing them on COVID related queries that they're not using on other health related searches. So if you take a quick look just for COVID-19 right now, you'll probably see statistics broken down by local, regional, national, international case counts. They're citing non-Google sources, which is pretty unique because as of late, they've been evolving their results pages to really keep users in the Google ecosystem. And this is definitely a pivot away from that in the interest of a public health crisis. Um, and additionally, they're really elevating these CDC approved prevention methods and treatments. And the most interesting thing I saw, they're even highlighting things like coping methods. That is a call out on the COVID-19 cert. So I think that all of that said, it shows that they recognize they have such power to shape how we view this and that in turn drives how we respond to it and how we act. And I think that all of these changes they've rolled out have done a lot more to kind of make sure we're getting really reputable vetted information from government sources, from scientists and doctors and researchers, and not just a Facebook post that a lot of people really liked. And now it's found itself at the top of the newsfeed at the top of the search results as well. So that's really, really helpful and really insightful. Go back for a second to like, you know, I want to pick your brain on the history of search and sort of how it's evolved over the last couple of years, but then in context of certainly the, the, the volatility and the rapid changing environment that was 2020 and now into 2021, as we're all mm -hmm. navigating COVID-19, I'm curious if, the, if what you have seen from these search engines and the behavior change are in line with some of the changes that have been slowly rolling out over the past couple of years, or has it sort of been in, in a very abrupt about face turn? Uh, and it's, 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 it has not been very in line with where these were, how these search engines have innovated or progressed over the years. So I'm just curious, like go back a couple of years and think through, you know, tell us, right, what have you seen and how this world has evolved and changed in the years leading up to the pandemic? And then as you go into COVID-19, is it is the is the changing environment sort of in line with that direction or is it not and is it a, is it a different path altogether yeah i think on the whole it's pretty in line with where they've been going i think the change that i really noticed is just they've really hit the gas and accelerated it over the past few years on the results pages themselves we've been seeing them testing out all of these different types of new functionality to see what users want to engage with what keeps them on the page the longest what helps them solve their query. And so as SEOs, we keep an eye on these types of things. And you know, we'll read the trade media and we'll see this features in beta, and then it goes away. And like, maybe it comes back permanently, maybe it doesn't. So we always keep an eye on those types of things. And the dramatic shift to the COVID-19 SERP, for example, is a great illustration of their ability to implement these changes very quickly when you need to. However, the challenge of rolling something like that out on a broad scale is making sure that it's elevating the right information. I'm sure everything that Google is doing with COVID-19 right now very much has manual oversight. I'm sure there are human checks before those things go out the door. And so looking at how to do these things at scale is much harder and kind of slows that timeline down a lot. And then I think another thing that we've seen that absolutely aligns with where they're going, but has probably been accelerated in light of the pandemic is just this overall emphasis on not only expertise and trustworthiness, but also user experience and making sure that what we're presenting on the web is just really upfront, straightforward, transparent, users know what they're getting. And we've really seen them double down on that as of late. 
Um, so what, I mean, what as a consumer, right? I'm, I'm speaking to you as a consumer of healthcare and as a patient as well, right? What, what is your advice to consumers or patients? How we can be uh, best informed about the course of our own care and, um, or best informed about our symptoms or best informed mm-hmm. yeah, um, about uh, the providers that we go search for. And when we're looking for a doctor and we leverage search engines to go find one, Right. What, what is your advice uh, to the patients on, that are listening in? Right. What would you tell them? Yeah, I think this is so interesting. Um, I would say my top level advice is question everything. Use the web like a skeptic. If I could tell you one thing, it would be use the web like a skeptic. Um, I recently read this study from a couple Stanford researchers where they looked into digital literacy. And really the finding that came out of it was They emphasize the importance of what they call lateral reading. So really going far and wide on your sources and really checking credibility that way. And it was an absolutely fascinating study. They took 10 professional fact checkers, folks really familiar with the internet and trying to vet out the legitimacy of something, 10 historians with PhDs from Stanford, very brilliant folks, and then 25 undergrads from Stanford, which important to know, located in the heart of Silicon Valley. So if we're looking at, you know, college students and digital natives and who's going to be best primed to use the internet in a savvy way, it's probably these kinds of folks. Um, And then these researchers asked them to complete a series of tasks on the internet. And one such task tied into healthcare, they asked them to evaluate two different articles on bullying from medical organizations. So one article was from the American Academy of Pediatrics. One was from the American College of Pediatrics. They sound very similar on their face. However, the American College of Pediatrics is a splinter group that broke off from the academy in 2002 over the issue of same-sex adoption. If you dig a little bit deeper, you can tell their membership is much smaller than the American Academy. The Southern Poverty Law Center has deemed them a hate group that has been deceptively named in their words. So what did the researchers learn in this study of how folks browse the web? Well, the group of fact checkers performed perfectly. All of them determined the information was credible. And they also spent the least amount of time using the article. So the takeaway here, this doesn't have to be a thing that consumes all of your time. To use the web in a smart way and protect yourself as a patient, you don't have to spend a lot of time doing this. What these researchers or what these fact checkers did is they quickly navigated away from the organization site. They went to news outlets, Wikipedia, independently verified the credibility. The researchers compared this instinct to taking their bearings. If you were a hiker, it would be orienting yourself in the woods. Contrasting, Historians did a little bit worse, but better than the students. Some of them got a little bit hung up on the citations on the college's website, seeing, okay, there's a citation. It's got to be credible. It's peer reviewed, something like this. And as these people were completing these tasks, the researchers were sitting with them and asking them to narrate out loud. What are you thinking? What, how does this, you know, make you think about the organization? So they're hearing their thoughts in real time. And what the researchers really noticed was they spent far more time on the organization's website. They read these two articles on bullying very in depth and most eventually cross-checked, but it took them a really long time. And most of them came to the right conclusion, not all. The students did the worst. They arrived at the wrong conclusions. They were swayed by design. Um, They called out the navigation, the use of bullet points, the lack of ads took it all at face value despite being digital natives. And so really the takeaway is just use the web like a fact checker. Go broad and wide when you encounter something that you're not sure about, check it from a variety of sources, try to get multiple viewpoints. I think it's so telling that 25 students at one of the most prestigious universities in our country, right in the heart of Silicon Valley, got duped by these two articles And one of them really had a very strong ideological bend. And it was just very clear which one, if you really got into it. And I think this is a perfect example for how so many of us browse the web these days. 
That's fascinating. Thanks for sharing all that. And, and thanks for all the detail behind that as well. Long answer. <laughs> it's okay. Um, and I, I really just, you know, is that, is, is that exercise, uh, you know, in your opinion, a microcosm of what we see happening all over healthcare, right? Is, is that, is that just, um, you know, we have folks going to WebMD and folks going to, you know, the, the random blogs on the web. Is this, is, is the, is the danger here that I think you're alluding to is when this starts happening across every geography, every zip code with every type of diagnosis code. Is that, is that the kind of thing that keeps you up at night? Yes, this is exactly the kind of thing that keeps me up at night. I think about the conversations that I've had with friends and family where they're trying to ask me more about my job. I talk about Google ads and PPC and then they say like, oh, that's a paid ad. I had no idea. And Honestly, that terrifies me because while I'm using it in an ethical way, I know that not everyone is. And it's so easy to get duped on the web if you're not being really skeptical. So absolutely. So following up then is what's your advice or guidance to marketers, healthcare marketers that are using paid search engine marketing as a tactic to try to drive patient acquisition or to try to drive um, uh, education and content distribution or whatever it might be. What's your advice or guidance to the marketers listening in? Yes, I would say my advice to the marketers listening in, it's so elementary, but not to lose sight of your audience, whomever it may be. Um, In SEO, this can look like prioritizing the user experience over explosive growth on a keyword that might not best serve your audience. Um, But if you're looking at it from an even broader top level marketing perspective, that might be being the voice of the customer and advocating for them internally when no one else is. If this is a paid search play, it can look at something like opting not to advertise against a keyword when you recognize that what I have to offer doesn't align with the search intent of what these people want. And I'm not going to add more noise to the conversation when I can't actually meet that need. So looking at all of our marketing programs critically through the eye of the customer and really asking ourselves, is this helpful for them? If I was in their shoes, would I want this? What? So getting a a little bit more specific to you, how much time for somebody who's an expert in search, how much time do you actually spend on a weekly basis actually reading about, learning about the patterns or the trends that are that are happening in the search world, right? What does that continuing education look like for you as a search expert? Yes, that is such a fantastic question. It is really all over the board. Part of it looks like, you know, every morning spending time to scan those industry trades like a search engine journal, a search engine watch, two of my favorites, scanning those kinds of things to see, are there any algorithm changes coming up? Like what's happening on the horizon? That's a big part of it. But I think even beyond that, there's this huge part of keeping up in search where really in 2021, what's good for the user and a good user experience is good for SEO. And so it goes even farther than just looking at search in a vacuum. And it's really cluing into what are people doing on my website and the properties that I manage and what like what queries are bringing them there and actually like looking at that data that you have access to as a marketer and trying to make sense of those kinds of things and cross-referencing that with new ways that people in marketing are using this kinds of data, this data. There are so many brilliant people out there that try something new, have success with an experiment, and then like want to share it with these people in these marketing communities. And it's just really cool to see that People on Twitter, for example, willing to help you out. They'll like tweet out a link to a blog. Here's a new way to use data that you're already sitting on. So those are the kinds of things I'm looking at. Uh, two more questions for you, Erica. And, and just wanted to say again, thanks so much for taking the time to, to talk with us today. Um, the first one is, where's the where? how do you envision the role of search and healthcare to change moving forward? What are some of the things that you're anticipating? Maybe not so much in 2021, and this immediate year ahead, but in future years to come, where is this landscape heading from your perspective? And I, I know I'm asking you to gaze into a crystal ball um, and, and tell us the future to an extent, but I'm just curious to hear where you're, what, 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 what the answer you'd come up with. Yeah, I think something that is really top of mind for me right now is 
user experience. And I know I sound like a broken record. I've been hitting on this a ton, but the reason this is so, so critical for healthcare is so many of our friends in the health system space are tasked with managing these giant unwieldy websites where they've got just, you know, so many subspecialties and child pages and all of these things. And it's a really hard ask to expect our marketing teams at health systems to really keep all of this straight and manage all of these things for SEO. And now what Google is really prioritizing is user experience. Um, one thing that's super consistent about Google as of late is this continued push for site owners to really prioritize whatever is going to improve the overall experience. And so back in May of 2020, they announced that core web vitals are going to impact our rankings a year from now, May 2021. And they're calling this update the page experience update. So what that means, core web vitals are a metric that anyone who has a site can go to Google and test this, but really includes real world user centered data that measures things like load time of your website, interactivity, and the stability of content. Stability of content is a great example here. It's that really annoy annoying experience where you're on a website and you're about to click a button like by now and something new loads on the page and it pushes the button down farther and click the wrong button. So frustrating. That's stability of content. So Core Web Vitals measure those things and Google has announced this is going to be a ranking factor in May of 2021. And because they've given us advance notice, they're really forcing site owners to prioritize user experience. And so it's one of those things that's going to become table stakes. It won't give you an advantage in search unless your competitors aren't doing it well, but it can negatively impact your search rankings if you're not doing it well. And so I think the challenge for healthcare is how do our friends in, you know, the payer segment, the health plan space who are managing these giant, giant enterprise level websites even begin to think about shoring that up just because that is a very big task that involves folks all across the organization and also getting the buy-in from all of the departments that you need, because that is very much something that sits outside of marketing. Okay. Last question is a bit of a lighter one. It's what are you reading these days? What, what's on your, uh, what's on your bookshelf? What have you been learning about reading? Um, uh, we, we ask everybody on the show sort of uh, for any recommendations. So just curious to hear what you've been into lately. Yes. So I have two books. So I'm doing this thing with a few friends where we are forcing each other to read books that we wouldn't normally read. So I've got a friend who's very into sci-fi and I have just finished The City We Became. And I actually found it to be a fascinating read around this virus takes over a city, it's taken people out, and it's actually an allegory for racism and how it disproportionately impacts communities of color. And I didn't expect to see it coming in a sci-fi book. So that's one that really captivated me. And then my book for them, I'm having them read The Warmth of Other Suns about the Great Migration. So I'm bringing them along on a very dense nonfiction read. Awesome. Love to hear it. Erica, thank you so much for taking the time today. We've absolutely loved having you on the show. So appreciate getting the chance to learn from you, to listen to you, uh, and, and for a chance to talk about uh, a topic that continues to impact all of us on a daily basis. So just absolutely thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the time. It was so great to catch up. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to this episode of Let's Talk About Healthcare. Remember, it's up to all of us to make healthcare work better for everyone, one day at a time. Catch you next time. Bye.